Um, I'm going to break with the other presenters and only present a single project, Gardens by the Bay in Singapore. Um, Atelier 10, we are international building services and environmental uh, designers. We work around the world and we have offices around the world. Um, which is funny because this, this project is in Singapore where we've done one project before, which was the Esplanade uh, Opera House, where we designed the shading system and the cladding system for it, and this was completed about 10 years ago. Um, unlike uh, the previous presenter, instead of using abseilers to install the facade, we had to use abseilers to clean it because it was such a complex facade system. But it, 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 it gave us a lot of experience working in Singapore, and so when the, the Gardens by the Bay project came up, um, it gave us some very relevant learning experience. I should add, before I start going into the detail, that we always like to work at the earliest possibility on a project. This is a, a little chart where we started to map what we think the, the, the different steps are in reducing carbon emissions. And urban design and passive design, the, those first two bands at the bottom, we think are, are about 50% of the, the carbon emissions of a building, if implemented well, if worked through logically and strategically. And so we really like to work at the beginning of a project. Um, the Gardens by the Bay project was initially for an international competition for a master plan, which we were involved in and have followed the project through ever since. Um, the client is the National Parks Board, um, and it's, it's got a large team involved in it, but the, the key... Uh, designers are really uh, grant associates who are the landscape architects, uh, Wilkinson Air architects, Atelier 1 and Atelier 10 and, and we've led the projects uh, design and, and uh, engineering with, with local engineers in uh, Singapore delivering the, the project further. Just a bit of a reference, it's the, the project, the Gardens by the Bay project is actually three parks uh, with uh, around the, the m main marina uh, in Singapore, with the main park being Gardens by the Bay Marina South, which, which is actually all we, we worked on in the end, although the, the project was for all th uh, the competition was for all three uh, gardens. Now it's also quite close to the Esplanade, um, so it's 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 a it's a exciting environment. This is all reclaimed land in front of the, the city. Actually, the original. Um, uh, seawall used to be along here. Actually, this road here is called Beach Road because that's 60 years ago where the beach used to be. So it's an it's a interesting and growing country in many ways. Um, so we, we thought about the projects and we uh, gave it a bit of thought and, and thought, let's have a bit of fun here, let's do something exciting and unusual. And uh, for the competition submission, we, we summarised this in this, this video, which will hopefully play. submission, and I think you'll have seen some images in that, that video, we took um, environmental design and ecology to be a, a central aspects of our design. 
we worked through how we could develop a, essentially a new ecosystem for the site, how we could use resources reflectively and in a circular nature, and how we could really try and integrate everything together. We developed a, a master plan that was heavily influenced by uh, environmental design, where even the, the positioning of the conservatories within this master plan was selected to maximise their availability for daylight. Uh, the, the urban design for around the site is to build between 100 and 200 uh, story high towers and so the, this location was one of the best for daylight within the site. Now we put that in and we thought great, great project, wonderful ideas, they'll never build it and never call us back and about two months later they gave us a phone call and said yeah guys you want it, get going and so about six years later this is where we stand now. Um, the project is about to open, it opens in June uh, next year although there has been a, a soft opening and so various portions of the site are currently visitable. So we were shocked that we built it. Um, if nothing else, I think, I think the other designers here know just how rare it is to get such mad things built. As part of the site, we have a number of things called super trees, which are effectively mega trees built by man rather than by nature, which range in height from uh, 25 metres high at the small level up to about 50 metres high uh, at the tallest one. The tallest one has a, a bar in the top, but fundamentally they are all part of the, the environmental strategy for the site. Several of these trees uh, house ventilation systems, several of them uh, generate energy. Originally we had ideas of uh, um, generating power by storing water at the top of them and dropping it down at night and running that through a turbine. But then uh, um, in the cold light of day, that, that somewhat dropped away from the scheme when we actually worked out we were going to produce about 10 kilowatt hours for about a million dollars investment. So we thought better of it. But we've, we've built them. Structurally, they are uh, quite interesting. They're effectively a concrete core with an ETFE membrane around the top with a steel diaphanous cladding system. There is planting uh, up to about <coughs> two-thirds of the, the height of the building to make them into a, a, a vertical planter. Uh, but then in the, the top of the uh, super tree, it houses, on the whole, photovoltaic panels to generate energy. Uh, and also in the core, we tend to have ventilation systems or flues running. So it's, a, it's an interesting way of integrating the services together. And this is uh, some of them under construction about a year ago. Um, just an image showing the, the integration of the photovoltaics into the building. And uh, a couple about three months ago, just showing the, the planting on them. And they have become one of the striking emblems of the site uh, and seem to, to steal a lot of the publicity at the moment. But the main focus of our work was actually these two conservatories, the, the cool, moist, and cool, dry conservatories, which have a total planted area of about 20,000 square metres each, although the total conservatory complex is about 60,000 square metres. And they're, they're quite um, challenging plants, I mean, for, for um, challenging buildings. Because for us, in, in temperate climates, we build conservatories and we put lots of heat in them and grow temp tropical plants. Singapore, being on the equator, they didn't want to have tropical plants. They wanted temperate plants and Mediterranean plants. And so we're trying to recreate a quite unusual set of environments in the, the flower dome. Sorry, the, I should add the two conservatories have had different names throughout their life. The main working name was the Cool Dry and Cool Moist, but they are now called the Flower Dome and Cloud Forest, so apologies if I ever start jumping around with them. The, the Flower Dome, or Cool Dry Conservatory, is trying to recreate uh, Mediterranean environments, which is the Mediterranean climate, not just the, the physical Mediterranean, so it includes South Africa, southern tips of Australia, areas in, in South America and California. And these are, are relatively temperate uh, climates. They are warm during the day but cold at night. The cloud forest or cool moist biome is trying to recreate a, a much more um, rarefied environment which is essentially high, high levels inside the tropics where the air is very moist because it's the tropics but their elevation makes them quite cold. The flower, um, flower dome cool dry conservatory is quite a large, it's the largest plan of uh, the two. Uh, it's 170 metres across by about 90 metres deep. To put that in perspective, you could park two A380s in there, jumbo jets, nose to nose, and they wouldn't touch the cladding. So these are substantial buildings. Um, and that's a, a picture of it uh, about three months ago. 
Inside the cool dry uh, conservatory, there is what is known as a, a, a temporary flower field. And the idea is that this field becomes a, a moving uh, experience of different types of planting throughout the year and throughout the program within it. And this is how it was planted up for the first um, display of planting inside the, the building. Uh, there is also something called a baobab leaf, which is uh, these rather strange trees from, from the Madagascan regions. Uh, and they've been planted inside the building on uh, top of what is a multifunction event space. Uh, and again, just a couple of pictures while it was under construction. It's always great when the construction pictures look somewhat like the renderings because it tends to mean we've analysed the same building the architects are actually designing and building. So it's always refreshing for us to get that right. And uh, just a, a couple of pictures inside. The other building is much smaller in plan. It's only about uh, 120 metres across by 70 metres deep. But it's much taller. It goes to about 60 metres in height up to the, the highest point of the rib. Um, and again, there's a picture of it. It's slightly behind uh, the cool, dry biome and is only just now being completed. Um, and again, some, some images inside. Now, one of the things that uh, everyone has to have in a building at some point in their life is a mountain. We've built a seven-storey high building that's entirely freestanding inside the wider building, which we've, we've taken to call the mountain, which also has the world's tallest uh, man-made waterfall inside it. Um, you know, just for fun, really. Um, on top of the, uh, the mountain is, is an area that we are calling the, the uh, cloud forest which is a much more ethereal zone. It's very calm, it's very quiet, so it's a very misty space, um, but also takes on a, a completely different in feel at night, where it just becomes this, this calm and serene point of, amongst a very busy city. Architectural rendering, and again, we can start to see it taking the same form as it's being constructed. Now, while this is great in terms of architectural design, there is an awful lot of complexity that goes into designing a, uh, a conservatory. You're not dealing with people. People are relatively well understood in terms of what makes people comfortable and what makes people happy to be in a space. For plants, you have to have very specific horticultural requirements. After we won the competition, the client gave us uh, a two-year research document they've been developing on the different horticultural requirements for the different plants inside the building. And we, we, we got a lot of information out of that. And in very quick summary, the, the uh, core dry uh, flower dome needs to have about 45,000 lux for a few more hours than Eden. Uh, in the daytime, it's 25 degrees at 65% relative humidity, which is relatively comfortable, but it's a fairly dry environment. And then at night time, it drops to, to 17 degrees. And then for one month and every three months, it needs to drop down to, six, uh, to 13 degrees. That's a typo. In the other conservatory, the, the cloud forest, it's very similar light levels and actually similar temperature levels. But the relative humidities are much higher, 80% 80 relative humidity, which it's, it's where you feel sticky. It's where you feel sweaty in that environment. It is a, a, a quite humid space. Now. We didn't know all of this when we went into the competition. We thought, probably don't need all the sunlight that's going to hit the building, so we should design a shading system in. So we worked with the architects and the structural engineer and developed a design that essentially had a series of fixed external ribs holding the building up. And those fixed ribs were designed so that about half of the sunlight would go through and about half of the sunlight would hit the ribs. And we thought this was a good compromise between sunlight and daylight. When we got the, the client's research brief, we realised that actually we needed to get a huge amount of light in there because Singapore is incredibly overcast. So one of the first things we did, and this is a very brief summary of it, is went and looked at the Singapore environment in every way that we can, can analyse. I mean, this is part of about a 100-page report that, that we wrote, um, just looking at the different uh, um, daylight levels, for example. So this is taking what is the, the maximum daylight level achieved throughout the year at a particular time in the day. So we could start to understand how the environment evolved throughout the day, how it changed, and really make sure we were building a building that was responding to the environment. As part of this, we discovered that Singapore is very um, 
uh, very overcast, but also receives a lot of daylight um, through a lot of the year. And one of the things that we were trying to always balance as we were cooling these conservatories rather than heating them was how we got enough daylight into the buildings for the plant, but also how we uh, balanced that against the heat load going into the building. And we'd just completed with Wilkins and Air uh, a few months before the Alpine House at uh, Kew Gardens, which we used an incredibly transparent glass, which again is a, a called glass house. But we used very transparent glass, but we found that for Singapore, we were using a very spectrally selective glass. So a glass that lets in about 65% of the, the daylight, but only about 30% of the, uh, the heat contained within solar radiation into the building, which was a, a, a good way of reducing um, heat load. But again, we had to make sure we were maximizing that 45,000 lux criteria. And as part of this, we worked through um, a number of cladding options and, and developed our own software to do detailed analysis of uh, um, the, the daylight experience within the space. We checked our, our thin original competition idea. We developed ideas for bowstring uh, truss inside the space. But in the end, the best um, compromise we found was a, a, a grid shell with a series of externally supporting ribs as because in Singapore, this is the, the grid shell with the, the ribs, as in Singapore, it, it is very overcast. And when it's overcast, we want to get as much of that light into the building. And this was the, the structurally lightest cladding system we could find, which also corresponded to structurally uh, the lower shading cladding system. And the detailing of it was, was quite specific and, and refined. And it went from going to a conventional grid shell with a glass support system through to, to an integrated grid shell glass support that was angled at a V-shape so that when the sun was shining, the grid shell itself would cast the lowest amount of shade into the space. So just on daylight alone, the decisions ranged from the positioning of the conservatories within the master plan, so a decision that was at a kilometre scale in, in length, down to the detailing of an element which is only 200 millimetres by 300 millimetres to make sure we were getting the best daylight response for the space. Now, when we went through that and analysed that, that response in a bit more detail, we found out we were doing very well, but we were getting some periods where we were getting over 45,000 lux. The horticulturalists said that that didn't matter to them. The plants were fine if they didn't get more than 45,000 lux. But for every uh, element of light we allowed in at that intensity, we had to cool it, we had to use energy to remove it from the space, and we had to design the systems to a size that allowed us to remove this, the, the elements from the space. <coughs> so we developed a, an external shading system with the architects to deploy at that level and to, to control the daylight level. And in very simple form, I, I won't go into the numbers, but very simple form, you've got a, a lot of sun coming in, and then a shade system starts to come in and, and occlude it. And also it can then fully occlude it uh, so that it also provides additional resilience so that if the systems break down, we can shade the building totally and, and allow some additional time for the maintenance guys to get in and get everything working again. But as part of that, we were trying to make sure that the, the shading was incredibly discreet. We'd gone to all the effort of maximizing and optimizing the, the structural system so we couldn't then bolt on shades over that to, that then occluded all the sunlight again. So the structural engineer came up with quite a clever idea of these self-furling shades inside the, the structural ribs. And actually, this is an early architectural rendering of them, um, where when they're not in use, all you can see is a tension cable. It actually requires um, self-furling uh, sail technology from the shipping industry to be able to, to, to operate. And it, it, it works very well. So it goes um, from a system where we have shades out. Uh, oh, this image doesn't seem to work. Ah. Um, to a space where we have no shades, a, a very clean exterior, and then shades out. And it is literally that contrast. Now, the, the, the shades are entirely proportionately controllable so that we can really make sure we get fine control of the daylight inside the space. Without the shades deploying, this is just tracking the, the light level that we receive inside the space through every hour of the year. And then 
with the shades deploying, it just trims it. It just trims it, so we get the, the daylight cut out at 45,000 lux and, and get really good control of light. We did look at what the impact would be if we removed the shades and just replaced it with uh, body tinted glass and, or something like that, and it really didn't work. As with every government project, um, cost became an issue at one point, so we had to go to the client and explain what would happen if we value engineered the shades out of the scheme. And we said, well, OK, we get a 50% increase in the, the cooling load. But the way we designed our system, it effectively doubled the size of all the air conditioning plants inside the building. Now, at the shades at a cost of about $4 million versus an additional $40 million for doubling all the plants, it, it became a real no-brainer to keep them in. And it was a really good argument to the client that uh, they were getting value for money. The other thing about the shades is that they have actually become something of a, a quite uh, emblematic uh, of, the, of the development. It's become a, a, a real thing that drives texture inside the building. And you get this lovely patination of light and dark and space and the different layers of structure, the grid shell, the shades, the, the ribs above it, um, casting through the space, creating a real complexity of, of light and shadow, um, which I think is, is a very nice experience. And you can start to see from, from early on in the, the construction where we're getting this patination appearing and we're getting some, some exciting spaces appearing. And then it can make this space a, a rather odd space because um, the front of the building isn't shaded. We'd curve the building down so that that front facade doesn't actually get hit by the sun. So when the shades are out, you end up with this incredibly bright external space, bright up... Um, roof and very high daylight, daylight levels, but actually the roof can seem very opaque at times, which is quite interesting. Uh, and again, people seem to, when they first went in there, seem to be quite enamoured and there were lots of people standing around taking photographs of the shades and running off, so we felt that was a, a good thing to add to the scheme. Um, and just at night, when the shades aren't there, it becomes a very different experience and uh, a, a very different environment. <coughs> now, while we can design the, the building envelope and the building location to be uh, very responsive to its environmental needs, we will always need to have building services in a cool building in the tropics. And so we tried to develop a, a, a building services arrangement that was as minimally uh, invasive to the aesthetics of the space as possible and was also as low energy consumption as possible. A key part of that was all the hard surfaces, all the concrete walkways have underfloor cooling built into them, and we have an extensive displacement ventilation system built into to all the um, surfaces of the area to make sure we're ventilating it appropriately. And we can just start to see how, in some of the simple steps, you get a very light grill work that, that has very low velocity air coming out of it. And actually, you can't tell that there's air coming out of it to the extent that uh, a few months ago when I was on the site, one of the air handling units was being taken offline and to check which grill had air coming through and which didn't. I had to get a cigarette lighter and hold it up to a number of different grills until I found the one where the flame didn't flicker. So you really can't perceive that this is um, a heavily serviced building while you're inside it, but it is incredibly heavily serviced. One of the key innovations that we as a practice ran on this project was to use CFD as a design tool rather than a validation tool. Usually with CFD, you, you design your project, you stick it into the software and you go, bing, it's okay, we're going to build it now. For this, we started to use CFD at a much earlier stage of the design. And actually, we were ramping up and down, for instance, ventilation rates and ventilation configurations until we found one that matched the horticultural requirements match the comfort requirements and, and got a good balance between system capacity and, and uh, comfort and, and conservation. We thought it was a, a good experience. We then moved on to the design of the, the cool moist biome, which was a very similar philosophy, although obviously with a seven-storey open building inside a, a larger building, there were some complexities about height and stratification of temperature that we hadn't perceived at the beginning. 
So we ran through all the calculations, the daylight stuff came out fine, radiation turned out fine, uh, went to the CFD, and then we got to a point where we realized it wasn't quite fine. Now, those of you who are non-technical in the audience, even you are probably thinking, red isn't a good color to be presenting to a client and have them sign off on a scheme. So we, we realized that we were getting into some problems with uh, the way that heat was building up inside this space. And so we developed <coughs> a system where we still use displacement ventilation at the bottom of the, the building and at the top of the uh, uh, cloud forest. But then at each of the levels, we throw air out of the side of the, the mountain to locally reduce stratification in a bubble around the mountain only. Uh, and again, we ran that through our, our CFD software, and we were seeing much more, more positive uh, temperature distributions, and so we progressed with this hybrid ventilation supply. The benefit to us of using CFD as a design tool was that we found this out during stage D and could redesign the work without substantial problems. Finding this out when you're on site can be an incredibly costly and incredibly abortive project problem. So doing the work up front and doing the thinking up front was very, very useful to us. Uh, this drawing doesn't appear to have come out, so I'll skip over it. Um, one of the key things about Singapore is that it's very humid. It's half a degree above the equator. Uh, this is what's called a psychometric chart. So this is temperature along the bottom and humidity levels up here. And each one of these little dots is a, a, an explicit hour over the course of a typical year in Singapore. And so we can see from this, you have the main temperatures between about 24 and about 31 degrees, but the humidity is always way up. So it's always between 70 and 100% humidity. So it's very humid, warm throughout the year. Our experience from working in, in Europe and North America has been actually for much more changes in temperature. You know, we're used to temperatures that go down to minus five, go up to 40 degrees at times, generally quite dry, but with with high humidity levels. And we've often developed uh, exciting responses to that by capturing that change. So using the night to, to store cool for the day, using uh, that change in, and ebb and flow in the season to, to our benefit. When we came to Singapore, we realized that none of our tools like that would work. But the, but the flip side of that is that it did allow us a very precise external environment to really optimize everything that we were doing against and really maximize it. But that humidity caused some problems. So to make sure we were getting the cool dry biome, dry, we um, were installing large desiccant systems. These use uh, essentially salts to, to absorb air out of, um, sorry, absorb water out of an airstream passed over them in the same way that you see if you buy a camera there'll be a little sachet of something that in the bottom of the box that says do not eat desiccant we needed a big supply of those to to absorb air now unlike a, a little sachet in a box of uh, a camera you can't be continually throwing away the the desiccant so you have to recycle it now once you've absorbed water into something there are limited ways you can get that water back out of it if you've got a towel for example you can wring out the towel and get it a bit dry. Or you can put it in a tumble dryer and put heat and air over it. For building desiccants, you need a lot of heat. So one of the strange things we found ourselves doing in the middle of Singapore, a country that for the last million years pretty much hasn't dropped below 24 degrees, is installing one of the la world's largest biomass boiler plants to make sure we had enough heat to, to dry this building out. And to do that, we developed a, a largest energy center down a, a back of house service road, which again is connecting into super trees. We dry desiccant in a, um, a plant room underneath the, uh, the lake cluster of super trees, which are all ventilating this biomass of it. But to get the heat, we needed a heat source, and we went with a biomass boiler. The biomass boiler raises superheated steam, which we run through a steam, and, uh, steam turbine to generate electrical power, so it part, partly runs the site. We run the heat through absorption chillers that generates cooling. We run the heat through uh, to generate uh, desiccant regeneration. 
we run the electricity from the steam turbines to generate uh, co conventional cooling with electrical chillers and run that all into the system. Now in Singapore, biomass is, is a bit of a, an odd subject. While there is a lot of greenery, it's mainly in public hands. And initially, uh, our client was, was somewhat skeptical of biomass. But on the other hand, we were, me and a colleague were having lunch with the chief operating officer of the National Parks Board, because our client is the National Parks Board. And he was then saying to us that actually the National Parks Board has a, controls a huge number of trees. Not least, they control every tree on every street in Singapore. Now, if you've got a tree growing in the tropics, it grows quite quickly. If it grows too long, the branches fall off. Now, if you've got people driving underneath that, that's dangerous. So the National Parks Board goes around and trims each of these trees once every three years to make sure they don't get too big and too dangerous, which means that they're trimming three million trees and they're doing it th uh, once every three years. And this is causing them to have uh, about 5,000 tonnes a month of horticultural waste that they were currently sending to landfill. And me and my colleague were chatting to the chief operating officer and he was saying it was an absolute travesty that he just had to sign this new contract uh, for the waste haulage at $70 a tonne to, to take away 5,000 uh, 5, tonnes of waste a month and bin it. And he was saying it just costs so much. And so we thought that it was far better to, instead of bin it, to take that um, material to our site and to burn it and power our site with it and also to, to stop them spending vast sums of money on, on landfill and, and take that money to us as well to a degree. As part of this we did a lot of operational um, energy assessment so there was limited regulatory requirements for, for energy consumption here there was no real requirement for, for detailed analysis that's a uh, uh, Singapore uses a ETTV, a, an overall thermal transmittance value for, for a facade, uh, as their building control requirement. And so we developed a lot of analysis to, to look at what we were projecting to use. Our client, for um, reasons best known to themselves, decided that as a benchmark they wanted to make sure that the building consumed less energy and less carbon than a con uh, conventional office building of the same floor space. I've always wondered quite what was going through our clients' heads when they said, we're going to benchmark a botanic gardens with cool glass houses against an office building, but that's the benchmark we had, and that was about uh, 7,500 uh, tonnes of carbon a year that was going to consume. And we got right down to about 1,800 tonnes or so uh, in, in terms of our uh, carbon emissions. But then when we factored in the power generation from uh, our biomass CHP and the photovoltaics and the other elements on the site, we're actually offsetting all the, all the power, all the co uh, carbon required to run the cooling systems by our on-site generation. So we end up with a net um, carbon positive cooling system for the site. So the project's running to a close now, as I said, um, it's opening in June. So a few months ago, we decided to redraw that original diagram we did as part of the competition submission just to see how much was still there and see how much of a story we could still tell. And we found that most of it is. Um, I haven't gone into a lot of the, the other uh, elements of the site, but for instance, there are a series of large water bodies on the site that recycle and purify every single drop of rainwater that hits the site is reclaimed and reused. Uh, wastewater coming from off the site comes in and is treated before it's being expelled. Um, while we're generating lost power, uh, one of the, the waste sources from the, um, the biomass boiler is a loss of ash. Now the first stage of ash you get out of it is actually high grade fertilizer. So we're reusing that on the site as part of the composting and, and also to displace the need to to bring in fertilizer to the site. Um, and we think it's a very powerful story that about turning what was a client's liability and all this waste that they're spending money to, to have put in a bin into something that's running their new facility for free, effectively, and also generating a waste stream of its, its own, which is also going into the facility to avoid them using other uh, resources for the first time. Admittedly, the 
The thing that was dropped off here was the idea of taking all the compost from the office waste and using that to grow mushrooms to feed fish to serve in the restaurants. That was lost, but I think almost everything else was retained in the end, and, and we think it is one of the, the greenest projects in Asia at the moment. Thank you. Okay, um, we're running a little bit behind schedule, so I think what we'll do is we'll take a 10-minute break now, you can stretch your legs, and then we'll come back and have um, the final two presentations and then a discussion. With